Hello, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm with The Optimistic American, and I'm with my guest here today, Dr. Asad Bashkailo. He's a psychiatrist in the Valley, has a great practice. He focuses on trauma. Uh, he came out of Bosnia. He actually was in a concentration camp for somewhere over a year. Uh, he was deeply involved with a lot of the events that happened in Bosnia, and we're going to spend some time talking about that. Dr. Assad. Uh, Assad is a friend of mine also, so I hope it's okay that if I call you by your first name. Uh, but uh, I appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start just by talking a little bit about the history of Yugoslavia. Um, I know that you came from Bosnia, but I think many Americans, they don't really understand what was happening in the world at that point in time. They know that we ended up in a, uh, in a war uh, over, that, uh, over the divide that had happened, but they don't really understand the politics of what Yugoslavia is and, and how those divides became exacerbated. Now, just kind of short for the public, um, Yugoslavia is divided up into about six different regions. The three major ones were the Serbians, the Croats, and the, uh, the Bosnians. Is that fair? Uh, former Yugoslavia was made up from uh, six different states. Mm -hmm. It's Federation of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. It was uh, from the West Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Macedonia. Okay. And of those six different areas, um, the, um, the, there's a, a long uh, checkered past. I know that the, it was a Serbian assassin that ended up uh, killing the Archduke Francis Ferdinand back uh, in the 1900s, causing World War I. And then later on, when uh, Hitler ended up conquering it, they put into place um, an individual. I can't remember what his name was, but he then finally was taken out by uh, Joseph Tito. Um, now, you were about 21 years old when Joseph Tito died. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So give me your opinion of him. I mean, my, what I hear and what I read was that in the very beginning, he was kind of a brutal dictator. But by the 1960s, he had gotten to the point where he was really good at pulling together the different factions of Yugoslavia. Is that, was that your experience? Okay. So if I can go back a little bit from um, World War I, uh, mm -hmm. finished in 1918. A group of uh, different Slavic people formed uh, uh, former Yugoslavia. It was a kingdom of Yugoslavia with the six independent state. Mm -hmm. And that country was functioning as a kingdom until World War II. When World War II came to our region, uh, uh, Serbian and Croatian uh, government at that time took side of, of Hitler. And then uh, Tito took a side of freedom and fighting Hitler and then formed uh, a new country. It's called Federation of Yugoslavia with the six independent states. One of them was Bosnia. So he uh, was um, fighting inside forces and outside forces, especially Russia. And he took a uh, side of West. And, um, now that's interesting because he was a communist, correct? Yes. And so uh, he was a communist, but yet he took the side of the West. Why was that? Do you know? Because uh, Russia at uh, that time, uh, Soviet Union, tried to take over uh, many European, East European countries, including Balkan. But Tito was uh, only one from different countries, like including Poland, uh, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bul Bul Bulgaria. He took stand with, with the West. He said to uh, Soviet Union, no. We are not going to join your uh, your association. So he took side back basically of United States and West, and we had very mild communism. I believe in the time that he was, he did a tremendous job. He put those six uh, states, different states, together, and he called it brotherhood. And then um, the only thing that I maybe was uh, right now op opposing uh, he tried to put things under the rug, right? Killing, atrocity in the World War II, a lot of people are killed. And uh, so he was saying, that's over, let's move on. That was his politics. When he was alive, it was working. So when he died in 1980, I was uh, uh, second or third year in medical school. I think I was, uh, it was May 4, 1980. And then... Um, May 4th, 1980, and you were in your second year of medical school. Second year of medical school. All right. That time, I remember when I was uh, exactly, I was in my dorm and we heard that that was uh, big news and bad news. When he died, his politics and his uh, fight for the freedom and good life died with him. 
unfortunately. Did you know that immediately? No, no okay. way. No, nobody knew. So because he always, um, he, he was always talking how he is going to leave country to good people. We, because we are different than many other Eastern European country. We could travel, we are f much uh, more freedom than any other Eastern European country, like communist country. So when he died soon, very soon after that, nationalism became prominent. And the most prominent are the, the most uh, population was Serbia. Serbian nationalism was rising and especially leading by uh, Slobodan Milosevic, who later died in international prison in the Hague, Netherlands. So Milosevic is Serbian, yeah. and he wanted to form what was it called, the uh, the Serbian, uh, uh, the nation of Serbia or something? Great like Serbia. Greater Serbia. Yeah. Okay. And so when he was forming Greater Serbia, um, did was he elected through a democratic means, or did he come about through the Communist Party? He he formed his own party. He became president of uh, he, the uh, Social Democrat Party. It's interesting because Hitler also formed Social Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. That's just a name. So he the interesting thing about him specifically as a person we are talking about people here is that uh, in in order to get elected, he he was uh, stabbing in the back his uh, best man, and uh, best man in some countries are not terribly important, but in Serbia, maybe one of the most important element of relationship is having somebody best man in your wedding. That's like become brother. When you say he stabbed his best man in the back, what does that in, mean? In politi politically, okay. he, he removed him from power. I see. And that time I was, I was at that time in Belgrade in the Yugoslav army. It's, it was a obligatory service that I was a year. I was working as a doctor in army. So I was- when you're in the army in the very beginning, are you at war with Serbia yet? No, no, no. Okay. It was like Yugoslav army. It was like obligation. Everybody has to do okay. one, one year. And I was in the army like a doctor working in the emergency room, basically, in the biggest army hospital in Belgrade. So he got into power by stabbing in the back his best man. At that time, everybody that I talked in Belgrade was against him. But nationalism is interesting. Like any other movement, when movement starts, what I believe, it's very difficult to stop, very difficult. Did you know that it was starting when it started? No. So was that because you were young and not paying attention at the time or just because people weren't really all that focused on what was taking place in general? All, all of those. All of those, all, yeah. All of those, and didn't, didn't care much about politics. I was like very young, I was 27, 28 years old. And then, and nobody else who, who was in politics, I talked to some journalists at that time, they said, no, nobody's going to vote for him. He is just like, look at what he did to his best man and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So but became very powerful person and then tried to basically take all over Yugoslavia. And, and when you say he tried to take over all of Yugoslavia, did he try to do that? So he created his own party, he created his own uh, he put himself into power, and then he began to take over the national government. So he had control of the military? Yes, that's okay. the key. It was Yugoslav army, the fourth strongest army in Europe. Fourth strongest army in Europe. Yes, okay. yes. And, uh, and when Milosevic did this, um, when that began to happen, um, did what was the reaction of the Bosnians, the Croats, others? Did, did they react to that? Initially, very slowly, but later became like fearful. When he attacked first Slovenia, because Slovenia is the most west country of former Yugoslavia, and they don't have many Serbian population. So it was war for like, I don't know, maybe, um, I hope nobody will be upset with me, I don't know, maybe a month, very short war, not many people died in Slovenia, and he left Slovenia. But he wanted to uh, call great Serbia, uh, countries like Croatia, uh, Bosnia, Montenegro, and uh, Macedonia. Uh, but Croatia and uh, Bosnia left the federation. Okay, so both of them left. Yes. Now, you were in the military at the time. Uh, no, no. I oh, was you working. had left the military? No, no, no. Yeah, I was, it was 1986 to 1987 I was in the army. Okay. Then we are talking about 1990. Okay. The Croatian government said, no, more uh, this uh, Milosevic nationalism, we are going to get out of the federation. And then Bosnia followed. Mm -hmm. And then immediately he attacked Croatia. And it was war between Serbia and Croatia. And we are in the middle and still we hope it's not going to catch us. Yeah, explain the, uh, explain the geography so that so the public are, can understand. So we are, Bosnia is in the middle of former Yugoslavia. West of us is Croatia, and west of Croatia is Slovenia. Mm 
East of us is Serbia and Montenegro and far east is Macedonia. So when war started over us between Croatia and, and Serbia, we still felt, at least me and my friend felt, no way in Bosnia because Bosnia is different. Bosnia is the only country in Europe that has three nations kind of equally. Uh, uh, um, there is no like major ma majority, mm -hmm. like Switzerland has a German, uh, Italian. And when and, you say and there are three, were they Serbians, Croatians? Serbian, Croatia, and Bosniaks. And and did they get along? Did did people fairly okay? Okay, fairly okay. Working relationship, marriages, friendship. My best friend, my best man was Serbian. My but many good Croatian friends, Serbian still have. But um, an urban we, population. Yeah, urban, any population. Mm -hmm. And then everybody that I talked to, we believe I was uh, obviously now uh, naive. Uh, because I believed in the brotherhood, I didn't believe in violence. I was raised differently, I guess. And then on the on the to the day the war started, I was uh, basically talking to my friends. We are not going to have a war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, some of the things you say that were interesting um, is that um, is that we're beginning to see in this process that political identities are beginning to form, not political philosophies, but identities. People are beginning to identify their nationality with their political party. Is that correct? Yes. And then they start including uh, religions and uh, any other any other division, basically. Anything they could use, even history. And even uh, even now, I, I can say it, that I have a friend, a like Serbian friend, who talked to me about Badalan Kosovo. I, 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 I doubt you you how much do you know about it mm -hmm. that was the uh, ottoman empire entering the balkan it happened in 1389 wow. and when i talked okay. to friend and uh, now uh, actually a couple months ago a serbian friend he told me we suffer in kosovo and my answer to him was i'm so proud of you that you are like 600 year old so you look like 60 to me yeah so this yeah. is interesting so, so yeah. i think again something that the public doesn't focus on is you have these six different states that are within Yugoslavia, the state begins to break up. The Serbians attack the Croats. Uh, Bosnia is in the center. Um, and because it's in the center, e even though it's an urban population where there are an equal portion of Serbians, Croats, and Bosniaks, there's, uh, I think I read the number that about 11% of them had intermarried. So there were a lot, there was a lot of intermingling between the groups. It wasn't really huge social divides. In your book, by the way, uh, uh, Dr. Bascalo, Bascalo, I wrote a book called uh, Wounded I Am More Awake. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you for giving me a copy of that. But one of the things that you said in your book that I found to be fascinating was that the, the medias began to get involved. The talking heads, I think, is what you called them. What did you see going on with the talking heads at the time? Yeah, the book I wrote was with Julia Liblich, a, a friend who is a journalist. She helped me write the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, media took side immediately. It was like uh, taking side of a nationalistic party and leaders. It was uh, it was so powerful that I guess th this is happening right now here. Mm -hmm. It's a similar story that uh, average person is actually not able uh, to read or hear what is right, what's wrong. We have a, a Nobel Prize uh, uh, writer, his name uh, from Bosnia, his name is Ivo Andrić. He said, an illiterate person is not a person who doesn't know how to read. A illiterate person is a, a person who doesn't know what is true, that he believes that everything is the truth, what he reads or hears. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. People start believing. And the, because the vision was very clear on nationalism, religion, region, country, history, uh, culture, everything. It was uh, people are bombed with this information and average person, I believe, couldn't. So when did you, if, uh, let's just go before you, uh, before the war started, but after Milosevic had come into power, at what point did you start to really recognize the ugly head of nationalism and the effect that it was have on dividing your country. When did that become clearest to you? Was it not until the end and the war started, or was it sometime before? So, sometimes before, but it was. Uh, I was thinking, like again, with my friends, we talk a lot about it, so we, it affected us. We started talking about news. Before that, we just drink coffee or you know other drinks, you know, and talk about sport and life and travel. But we start talking, and that was the. I, 
thinking back, that was the turning they point. They drink those other drinks everywhere in the world, don't they? Those, they do. those they other do. drinks, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're 20 yeah. years old. So, right, right, right. Um, so, you, uh, uh, so then the war starts. Uh, do you join the military right away? So war started, it's a, a story for me, it was uh, a war in Bosnia. Um, it, it was still believed there's nothing to happen. I was driving to work, to my hospital. It's a five kilometer drive and a group of young people, cover head, uh, stopped me. And then with a gun, big guns, six of them. And then uh, I, I get out, I said, guys, move, move. They put something on the road. And I said, move, I have to go to work. They said, no, you cannot. And then they point a gun to me, I said, go back. I said, no, I'm going to go to work. I was stubborn, you know, young. Mm -hmm. And then one guy uncovered himself. I recognize him, I mean face, not the name. Right. I still don't know, I wish I knew. And he told me this, word by word, he said, Doc, please go back. We have ordered to kill everybody. And that's how war started. Came back home. Which, which who were they working for at the time? At uh, that time, it was, at uh, that time, Serbian. Okay, yeah. Serbian army? S yes, and paramilitary. So that, that moment, I came back home with my car. I have, uh, um, that, when I came back that afternoon, that evening I was on front line with, uh, with my hunting gun and a lot of medical equipment that I accumulated over the years because I was an ER physician, I have things at home uh, because I was doing some home visits. And that night I was on front line. Wait a minute, so you're stopped by this uh, the Serbian paramilitary person. Yes. Uh, he ends up knowing you, he pulls his mask off, he says, Doc, go back home, we're ordered to kill everyone. Yes. And you say that night you were on the front line with your gun. Does that mean you joined up or does that mean you were enlisted? We, we have a, a group of us, uh, friends. That was, we, I'm from a very little town. Mm -hmm. That was maybe a 50 or 60 of us. We hear that when I came back, I told a story. And then other people came with the news that Serbian army coming from east uh, part to our town. And we said we have to defend. And then we got whatever we had. And I got my medical equipment and we went to uh, one a little uh, village and uh, put up a line and tried to defend ourselves. Were you able to? Oh, I was thinking. I was thinking that was interesting night. So when I get there to that uh, little village, I established little with few doctors and nursing, established little like hospital, I called. And then it was shooting and I we lost six, uh, uh, six people that day. And then- You lost six people. Yeah. And then uh, what happened is that shooting stopped at around 8 p.m. I was sitting outside with a uh, female doctor, who, she was older than me, uh, having coffee. And uh, she told me, you've been in the military, I have no clue what is the meaning of this. I said, that's good news, there is no shooting, we are safe, I told her, again, naive. And because I didn't believe in this, uh, that neighbor will kill neighbor. And then in the morning, Around four o'clock, there was uh, some very unusual noise, and I, I woke me up. I slept a little bit. And then I see uh, like hundreds of tanks coming to us. A hundred tanks, is that yes. what you said? Yes, okay. from Serbia, in direction from Serbia to us. And that was to, this, to the point that I saw them. And then we pick up our equipment, some, not everything, and run away. And back, uh, I came back to, to my town. At that time, I knew we we lost that uh, territory. Mm -hmm. And so you come back home, and um, does does some type of formal army begin to then organize? Yes, yes. the Bosnia organized formal army called Army of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatian part uh, organized own party, we joined to each other against Serbian army. Now, as I recall, that army was like police departments, police department gear, hunting gear. Yes. They weren't nearly as well equipped as the Serbian army, is that? I mean, we didn't have anything. Didn't have we anything. Just have, I'll tell you, when um, at some point uh, you realized, uh, because I'm not a soldier, you know, but you have, you start developing the, those feelings, your family is behind you. So well, we stay. Hmm. And so, I remember uh, you talking about a battle in your book um, where finally um, you and the Croatians were able to push back the Serbians. And uh, do you recall that battle? Yes. What happened? June 6, June 6, 92. 
June 6, 1992. What happened we, in that we battle? Took, we took our town back and some other towns on east uh, east part of the river. Uh, how, do, how, do, how do people with handguns and rifles and police department gear defeat a fully equipped army? How does that happen? So we, uh, every day, the, the war day is not like uh, mine and yours uh, working day. It's not. It's a day is like a, a year. Every day we did something. We even got a tank. And one guy, he knew how to get tank from Serbia. And so uh, then uh, Croatian army helps that time. And uh, we uh, trained. It was a lot of people who are trained and everybody said they want to get our town back. So it was a big battle. We lost a lot of people. And uh, I was, again, a doctor uh, for civilian, not only for army uh, personnel. So you were in charge of, during these uh, battles, three field hospitals, mass unit type things? Even more than that, yeah. I was moving from the place to place and would, uh, you know, some sometimes I would treat wounded soldiers or enemy or our soldier and then uh, civilian children even because there was no other hospital. Everything was shut down. Mm-hmm. I was only a doctor in the region that time to treat children with the fever or... or uh, yeah. I, I put, a, I, I put a, a pregnant woman who has to deliver, and we didn't have a car. I put her in a t- our tank mm-hmm. and get her to, to the hospital. I recall one of the stories yeah. where you had a Serbian soldier who came in and you began to treat him. And uh, he was someone who had terrorized people inside the village. Um, and then villagers came in to try to take him away. Do you want to share that story? Yeah. Yeah, he terrorized people in Mostar city, not village. Mostar? Mostar. It's a beautiful city with a famous bridge. And um, so I, he was a wounded soldier. So I, I, it was dark, it was night. You know, I treated him as a bleeding in the left left shoulder. I stopped bleeding and covered his wound and everything. But then somebody recognized him. And they said, this is the guy who killed adult couple in Mostar. And they, wanna, they want to kill him, our people. I have to uh, protect him. You have to protect yes. him. Why do you have to protect him? Because people try to to kill him because they when realized uh, who he was. Why not? Why not back away and not take responsibility? What made you feel like you had to take responsibility to make certain that they didn't kill him? Uh, I mean, probably a lot of things, but you know, at least I can tell you right now. I'm a physician. He was my patient, and I and and I read story about. Before the war happened, I, I read a lot of books, and I knew that like prisoners should be treated uh, fairly. So I protect him with my gun, actually. With your gun? Yes. And uh, did they back down immediately? Or? Yes, yes. And people know me. I, again, I was from a small community. I was a physician. I was a former basketball player. So people knew me. You know, I was not to, like... We're going to have to do a pickup game. Yeah. I didn't know you played basketball. I was, <laughs> I was, I was solid. Were you? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm a uh, hack. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, I people knew me, and when I when I said this is uh, Doctor, I said no, no, don't mess up. And I had my gun, and I said no, nobody. And I got him to the hospital. What happened to him later? Honestly, I don't know. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of flip over to uh, the portion where um, I know that you and the uh, Croatians end up uh, on the same side, but after you win this battle. Um, it looks like the Serbians and the Croats cut some type of deal uh, to basically divide up Bosnia. Is that correct? Yes, th- that's correct, and that's happening, still happening right now. It's still happening right now? Yes. Okay, if we have some time, we'll try to hit on that a little bit. Oh, yeah. I know that uh, yeah. you wrote a fascinating letter along with uh, another group that uh, def- definitely deserves some attention. So when that division takes place, um, you end up in a concentration camp. Um, I remember in reading your book in the very beginning, it, it didn't seem like a big deal to you in the beginning. It seemed to you like, well, you're sitting here with people that you know, both guards that you know, as well as other people that you know. Can you describe what that experience was like? So I was arrested on a- April um, uh, 20th, to, uh, 1993, so uh, by a Croatian uh, paramilitary, and was uh, taken to army uh, barracks, uh, in in the concentration camps, I was uh, I spent uh, over a year in six of those camps. They moved me frequently, 
And initially it was uh, not difficult. We did, couldn't leave. They, they forced us to work on something, but there was no killing. There was no torture. We had uh, two meals. Um, and then a uh, process of get, getting like more violence and more violence was becoming every single day to the point that they very soon they start uh, torturing and killing people. So um, you told the story of a man named Boko, which I believe you knew from before. Can you tell a little about him? Yeah, he was a man guard in a few of those camp, and he is one who killed people in the camp, and he is unfortunately still free, even though some you know, international war uh, tribunal community is looking for him. Everybody knows where he is. He's hiding in, in Croatia. He initially was difficult, but it was, he was not that dangerous. But very soon, the transformation that was known uh, story in a different concentration camp in Holocaust or another history that guards got into then transformation. So from a guy who was a waiter in a famous cafe bar that I sometimes go, I knew him superficially, he became a, a, a war criminal who killed people. So he goes from being a waiter that uh, you actually kind of know to somebody who's terrorizing people. He seemed to pick you out quite a few times. Yeah, he did, uh, probably because he was one of those that he didn't like how other guards treated me and other prisoners. Because, again, a physician and basketball player, I had some reputation. of, uh, And then he didn't like if other Croatian guards liked me or bring me some extra food. He got upset. And he did pick me up. He tried to kill me, basically. So I remember one story uh, that you told about him was that uh, after he went to beat you, he was stopped by other people. But the next day, he beat uh, a series of people with baseball bats and killed them. That that was different. That was different person. Oh, this one, okay. yeah, this one is Boko uh, was coming. Um, uh, one one day he came and he uh, singled me out and he said, oh, "I'm going to kill you now." He had a gun, and then he didn't. And then he said, I'm not in the mood to kill you. He always called me Big Doctor. That was my nickname, my nickname basically. So he, he came next. He said, I'll come in tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. I couldn't sleep. 6 a.m. he comes. He said, get out. I get out. He had a gun, and he said, not today, tomorrow. And, you know, third day or fourth day, I didn't care. But first day, I was scared. I couldn't sleep. And he shot so, at you one of those days, did yes, he Yes, he did. A uh, bullet went between your legs, as yes. I recall. Yes. And, uh, yeah, that had to be uh, stressful. You had a friend that I found to be fascinating, uh, Kappa, and, and definitely his story is worthy of telling. Would you tell us the story of Kappa? Yeah, we are same age. We came uh, to elementary school. Interesting about Kappa, he, was, uh, he is my neighbor and a friendly brother. And uh, he, before the war, he was... Um, he was genius, basically. He he could fix anything, like you're from car to telephone or dentist uh, equipment, anything. He could make everything. He is first in our little town that he moved with TV remote. He uh, make his uh, uh, gate uh, for him opening from the car with TV remote. He did it. We couldn't believe he was telling me he's going to make it. I said, no, Kappa, not this one. <laughs> and then he did it. So he was expert. And then he was the same in the war. He was really good soldier. He organized us, actually. He was leading a group of, I think, 300 good soldiers, and he defended our town. And then in, uh, when Croatian turned uh, on us, uh, they attacked our town. He defended town. They couldn't arrest him, but they got women and children on the on the plots, on the place. They said that we're gonna kill them if you uh, if you don't surrender. He surrendered, and they told him we are not going to kill you, uh, and then um, they kill him. And they found his body in Croatia in 2013, I believe, and buried. We buried him. So my understanding of the story is is that uh, what you're saying is is that they. Uh, began to abuse other people, other women and children in the town unless he'd give himself up. Yes. So he gave himself up as a warrior to save the other families. Yes, and then uh, then he was, um, they they got him in, in prison and, and he was killed um, two nights later. And uh, you were called in to see the body? No. Okay. At that time I was in the camp. Oh, okay. I saw him, I saw him when they beat him up. Before he passed away? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, he was wounded pretty bad when you saw him? Yes. And he was beaten badly. And uh, he told you at that time he knew he 
he wasn't yeah. going to make it. Yeah. He always knew. He was like, you think he, there, there are people like him. I said genius. It doesn't mean he was genius to his hand. He was genius. And he always knew. I call him very often when he told me like uh, six months before the war, he told me, we're going to have a war. I'm going to defend this town. And I call him crazy cop. And he was just laughing at me. He never talked much. He was an interesting guy. He said, me and you will fight for our time. I said, Captain, no way. We are, we are not going to fight. He always knew. Hmm. And uh, so about this time, I also kind of began to read about your condition. What was your condition at this point in time in the prisoner or in the concentration camp? It was uh, slowly uh, losing weight. To, to the point that I was arrested in uh, April 20th, 1992, probably like uh, three, four months later, I lost like uh, probably around uh, 80, 90 pounds. Okay. So there was no food. There was no food. There was no water. It was summer. It was July in one concentration camp called Dretel. That was the worst. So there was no water. The VE, we, they gave us food for 10 seconds, a little uh, hot, very, very hot rice that you have 10 seconds to eat. They measure it, and that's it. And then uh, after- They measure the time? Yes, they measure you had time. to eat? Yeah, if you are not done, they hit you with a, with a gun to the head. So, uh, and after that, in the evening or afternoon, un unannounced, they would shoot to us uh, through the uh, a tiny aluminum wall of that cell that was 700 bodies with not, not much space. And they start shooting. Just a random, ups, rough, ra yeah, random shooting, and people. So, yeah, that is. and so the, uh, so um, you've lost about somewhere near a hundred pounds, I think that the book right. said. You yeah. have a, a beard. You probably don't look much like what you look like when you first went in, um, and you're losing faith and you're losing hope. Right. So, what happens? What saves you? What pulls you out? Okay, so you know f a few things. I think that the hope is uh, never left me much. You know, there was a time that you kind of has less hope, but hope never uh, left me. Uh, that time is uh, that I frequently think, and I say to people right now in the piece, that time that you can use my experience, you actually come to immediate family. That's it and maybe one friend or so. That's very important for me that I learned because I have many like friends or something, and some of them are now guards at the camp. But you realize immediate family and the, the, the uh, hope to see them again. Uh, I didn't lose hope that I'm going to survive. I always have uh, hope that I'm going to survive. So what happens? So you're in the prisoner or you're in the concentration camp. Um, the, when do you first hear the news that maybe the war is over? Uh, we, uh, it was it was January 1994, and uh, uh, we hear there is some some uh, peace agreement going on, and then we saw some release relief of the guards are not threatening to to kill us, and there is not much torture going on. Maybe a little bit more food, and there was one time. Uh, the, the most hope I get when was like uh, president of European Parliament for Human Rights uh, knock on our door and uh, and he said his name and uh, his name was Mark Auslander, I remember. And that time he gave us some promise that we can be released soon. And that was January 1994. I was released in April 1994. So the, uh, so the, uh, NATO army basically came in and began to provide help. Is that what took place at the end of the war? End of the war, the the war uh, wouldn't uh, be done uh, without help of uh, first of all United States, and uh, I, th I think Bill Clinton has to do some, and definitely uh, NATO with General Wesley Clark helped, and they decided to bomb a Serbian uh, a position in 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 the Bosnian territory, and that was end of the war. So we always have a little um, kind of feeling that maybe they should have reacted earlier. So what's your family, your wife specifically, what, what's going on with her during this entire time you're in the concentration camp? So she was, uh, she was uh, also in camp for a month uh, with my two young boys. At that time, uh, two or maybe one year and a half and three year old, and my uh, mom. 
in a concentration camp for a short time, for like uh, between three and four weeks. I was always, again, I always had a, uh, some guards to tell me about them. And when they uh, tried to move them to different camp, uh, uh, my mom said who she is, and the driver who was taking them to camp said, I know your son, he is a good guy, and I get you to bus station, and uh, if you have passport, you can go to Italy. And that happened. They end, end up in Italy, and they came to U.S. Uh, soon after that, and I joined them by United Nations, got me to United States in August of 1994. Do you remember the day you were released? Yeah. What was it like? Well, I was released, on, again, I, under unusual circumstances. A uh, Red Cross from Geneva came, and the concentration camp was uh, uh, Mostar, uh, big city, Mostar. They came, and they started releasing everybody. But not me. And I never know, not me and maybe six, seven other prisoners. Mm. And then I met earlier, we had a, a woman, uh, her name was Caroline. Uh, she was from International Red Cross uh, from Geneva. And I talked to her, I speak a little bit German at that time, I studied in school. And uh, she, she knew about me. And uh, when they tried to push me back uh, to, to the camp, I saw a UN uh, army outside, like 15 yards from the door. And I asked her with my body language, can I run? And she said to me, yes. It, she showed me if I get to them alive, I'm okay. I ran away. You ran away? Yes. And, and then I was released. They couldn't come to UN battalion. It was Spanish UN battalion. Hmm. The, uh, so... Uh, so you leave and uh, you join back up with your wife. Now, uh, how long did it take before you came to the United States? So from April to, to August, uh, for uh, four months. Almost right away. Yeah, did four you come months. Did you under refugee status? Or yes. Did you? Yes. Okay. And um, the, uh, um, when you were leaving, you were an MD? Or were you yes. a, psych a, a, psychologist, yes. a yes. psychiatrist? Yeah, I was MD, basically family medicine doctor. I was working in emergency room also. I want to say here, that when we talk about hope, mm -hmm. I think it's extremely important that uh, that people understand there is uh, there is always hope, and that sometimes we need a push by either a friend or somebody else. When I was in refugee camp in Croatia, waiting to come to U.S., uh, there was uh, Peter Galbraith, ambassador of United States to Croatia. I visited our refugee camp. And like several thousand people went to playground to talk to him. I was the only one that didn't have interest to talk to him. And from the, he speaking to the crowd, he saw me. He came with the interpreter. I didn't speak any English, by the way. He came with the interpreter. He said, how come you didn't come? And I was angry. And I said something, I, I don't have interest in your story. And he said, I have interest in your story. And then he asked me, what's your plan? I said, I don't know. And he told me, when I told him I'm a physician, he said, my wife is a physician or somebody in his family. I think wife. You go to U.S., you pass two exams, you got your license, you're going to be a doctor again very soon. And that put me back on track because that my view was wide now, not narrow. Okay, so I want to talk about this. I yeah. want to talk about this whole concept. You become a psychiatrist, and I know that one of your specialists is that you focus on trauma. Yes. All right, talk to me about that. So trauma is, it's uh, any trauma. We, I talk, mostly we talk today about war trauma, but I want to tell you it's any trauma, seriously, from, from car accident, from uh, rape and ch child abuse, uh, the... the, the, the uh, the psychology in psychiatry talks the same because we cannot quantify. It doesn't really help e either me as a clinician or person to quantify trauma. We, we don't compare trauma. So um, trauma, the way how I see it, how I try to help the people is because most people who are traumatized, they got stuck, uh, frozen in the time of trauma. When you are frozen or stuck in the past, because you cannot live in the past, right? So when you are stuck in the past, you even lose ability to see or to remember who you were before trauma. 
and definitely you lose ability to see who you can be. So you got stuck in the past and we cannot live in the past, we cannot change it. So what I try to help people to process this trauma and teach them and help them to understand that trauma is just a little piece of them, part of them, but trauma is not everything about them. They are much more than traumatized persons. So I, when I think about myself, the trauma is just a little piece of me. I think it gave me some different view, different experience, and then, but that's not me. I'm somebody else than traumatized person. So that's what I was trying to give them, um, not just hope, give them a possibility to see the future and to see today because we live uh, today. We cannot live in the past. Do you have any anger or resentment uh, against what happened to you? No. Have you actually forgiven people that were involved with it on the other side? Inside me, yes. Inside you, yes. And uh, is that key to recovery? Yes, because whatever you carry, uh, whatever unpleasant memory or unpleasant experience you carry with you is going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And you are responsible for your own uh, stuff that you carry around. Mm -hmm. So get rid of that anger and uh, resentment or anything else. And think, um, uh, take control of it. it. It was a process. I'm, I'm talking right now because you have somebody... to give up being a victim? Oh, yeah, definitely. A victim, you need help. I'm a, I'm a survivor and I'm, I'm a winner. You're a survivor and a winner, not yes. a victim. Yes. It, that is a different way of looking at the same exact issue. Yes. Yeah. So talk to me about the narrow and expanse. Any stress. What we talk here, you, you mentioned initially, we're talking about media here, and uh, bad media and uh, violence in the media. Uh, any stress, any stress obviously has psychological and physiological changes, including cardiovascular disease as a consequence of stress including joint disease. So do you think that, that people could be experiencing trauma from watching bad news on a nightly basis? It is, uh, it is in, uh, uh, quantified in, in uh, our major book uh, category. One of the symptoms of PTSD is when you f frequently watch bad news or violence, you can get PTSD. Yes, that's correct. Wow. Yeah. And then what uh, I'm talking about f psychological and physiological changes of stress. People can die from stress, period. Okay, so psychological and physiological. But another one is like when we talk about, I put together with the hope. What happened with stress? Because the way how our body responds to to stress, our views for life and future narrows. One of the major symptoms of PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. One of the maybe first symptoms that appear is person is not able to see near future. So narrow. A uh, view narrows, so we are. I'm working with them to open up. In my culture, we have a nice saying about that: when one door is closed, hundred others are open for you. You have to find them. How to find them? Uh, you have to put some effort. You have to work on it. It's a process, and it takes effort. It's a challenge, also. And so, how do you help a patient do that? I work with them first to get them unfroze from trauma and tell them who, who they can be and who they were before the war. One of the, uh, the concepts when I know that somebody, somebody is uh, resolving uh, traumatic experiences, if they start feeling or thinking about things they like before the trauma. Mm -hmm. If they go back in previous life, that happened to me soon after I came to Chicago. Um, I have to mention Chicago, I love Chicago. So uh, I came to Chicago, it was like traumatized, didn't know what's my future, it didn't speak English, I started, uh, I started to study that language. But uh, once uh, one artist told me, when you are able to enjoy things you used to enjoy before, you are healed. And let me know, he told me. Because I challenged him on his art, he was uh, drawing picture of like animals that are scary and things. I said, what are you doing to make something nice? He said, let me know when you are able to feel and think what you did before the war, then we are both healed. And then I make nice picture of flower. Wow. Yeah. Was that an epiphany day? It was a, a discovery for me. I was hoping for the day that I can do enjoy things like I did before. And it came very soon, very soon. Okay, so let's uh, let's deal with this in kind of modern day America where people are on a nightly basis, I don't care whether you're watching Fox or CNN or MSNBC, 
you're being beat up with uh, with negative messages that are terrifying you, terrifying you from uh, from your ideological standpoint, maybe from uh, your identity standpoint. Um, and so you're a dad, and you uh, are a mom, and you're dealing with that uh, trauma or with those challenges. You're saying to me that that actually can be uh, exemplified in something that's close to or is PTSD. Yes. That's All correct. Right. And so what, what are the symptoms someone would see if that if that actually was taking place? Well, symptoms are divided in a few categories. First one is like you don't see the future, and then uh, there is a, a intrusive thinking about what happened. Even if you watch the news uh, once, you are still thinking about them because they are bad news. Intrusive thinking, anxiety, uh, uh, nightmares, uh, flashbacks and avoiding uh, to visit places that are similar, reminding you that, to that trauma. There are many symptoms of PTSD, but mostly anxiety and depression in those categories. So bad news, violence, is study, being studied in our science. So violence on TV, media, or video game can cause uh, violent thinking, violent behavior, and violent emotion, period in children and youth can cause um, that those youth and children can be afraid of other people, afraid to socialize, afraid to make uh, friends, and they don't understand how other people can feel a pain even. So increase uh, risk of violence. And how do you deal with that? There's recommendation for right now, and I, I can tell you what I do, and I follow those recommendations. We have to limit few things time, how much we spend. Uh, most recommendation I read in the study is uh, 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day? 30 minutes a day. Do you have patients where you see that they become obsessed by? Oh, yes. Uh, by social media or by the nightly news or that type of thing? Yes, and I have patients who told me they listened to me and they reported to me they feel much better. <laughs> so uh, 30 minutes, then you, that's a time limitation. And never do in the morning, never in the morning because you feel happy in the morning. You go to work and uh, never do before sleep. You are not going to sleep well. So the time limitation, limits then sources. Uh, by the way, I do not watch any news whatsoever on TV. I choose, I limit who is giving me the news. Uh, mostly, uh, is a, it's a, I follow two, three journalists that, that are good on Twitter and then get basic news. And me and my wife, we always said, you know, we don't watch news. If if we if something bad happened or big happened, we're gonna know. Yeah. There is no way we're not going to know. When we we did watch news before here, and we recognize we recognize we talk about our experience more. We are not happy, and when we uh, turn off that main uh, news, I'm not going to name them. When we turn them off, we start feeling better and happier. So limitation, who do you get the news? Limitation on time. Same, uh, same things for kids. We have to limit time uh, to our kids on social media. We have to try to limit them. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, and there's no doubt. Um, you know, if, you, if you're watching the nightly networks, you're going to get pretty negative news. I, I, I love the fact that they have breaking news every five minutes, but the reality is breaking news really isn't every five minutes. It's, it's a rarity. What's happening right. today in the Ukraine is breaking news. But yeah. what we've been watching over the last month maybe hasn't been on a nightly basis every five minutes um, breaking news. It's just a way for them to be able to keep viewership. You can also get, uh, you can also uh, read news and listen to news that's more hopeful. Uh, you know, and there, I think there is a lot of hopeful news out there that oftentimes we don't pay attention to. What's happening in science and technology and innovation and in business, besides what you can do with your life in terms of outdoor recreation or with your hobbies or with the things that you care about or your family, your children, your wife, your husband, um, there's, there's so much good, but it's real easy to get absorbed into the other. All right. It's, it's unusual that that uh, mainstream media are using uh, violence, how to show what happened in the world, what's happening or what may happen. Uh, the fear, uh, there, is a, there is a concept that fear in the media, and I experienced that obviously, it's used as a tool. Mm -hmm. And a politician, or uh, you said earlier that media are being spokesmen for some political party. Mm -hmm. So they become the same. They become one unity. Mm -hmm. And they use fear 
as a tool to control, to divide, to polarize. And they have a purpose in that. I'm not sure I understand everything of that, but I see that as an as a ongoing process. And then people with, are scared. But with fear, yeah. it comes back to what you said a moment ago, you begin to see very few options. Yes. Very yes. few. Yes. And to get beyond that, you have to look at the greater options. You have to recognize the opportunities that you have. And you need yes. a wider view. I love that, looking back at the, uh, the flower and going... Uh, and looking at what happened in your life before the war happened to be able to get over right, the trauma. Right. Your story is amazing. I mean, it's just, it, it deserves more time and attention. So we're going to do some overtime on this one. Uh, I want to want to hear your, your immigration story. I want to hear the story of you coming to America and what that was like. Can you repeat the story with the general? Uh, it was not general. It was uh, United States ambassador to Croatia. Okay. P Peter Galbraith. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I came to U.S. not as immigrant. I came as a refugee. There is a different. I was kicked yeah. out from the from the country. So when I he he told me when he told me there is a future. So that was what I was talking. He widened that view for me. That was very narrow. It was just like survivor story to stay alive. He opened up and he gave me the future. Remember, I told before about PTSD. People who have PTSD trauma, they don't see the future. He opened up for me. I believe we all need something to kick us out and tell us there is a hope. And I'm here to talk about hope. I came to U.S., to Chicago, didn't speak any English. Started to study medicine book first in, in English language. I read, it was like six, seven books for one exam. I had two exams. And then I took me one page, took me like two weeks to read one page. Uh -huh. with because they were in English. Yeah, this, this is a different language. And then, but uh, my, my hope was the future that I can be, what I can be. That time I dealt with trauma. When you are traumatized, and again, I'm not comparing war trauma, civil trauma, car accident, anything. When you are traumatized, at that moment, you lose control. That's the key word, that you don't have a control. Now, when I was free, I was regaining my control. And I have a control, and my portion was what I'm going to be and what I was before. That is decision. That's the decision. And the, how human, uh, human nature is very unusual, though. We have to accept it. Our, another writer, uh, Bastian Reder, um, his name was uh, Mesha Salimovic. He said, unfortunately, the evil is close to human heart, unfortunately. To do well, to do good, you have to put effort. And I remember that. So effort is a key, how you get out of this uh, uh, situation that was not hopeful. Effort. We have to take control of our life, and we have to do effort. If we are waiting for something to happen, somebody else will help us, nothing will happen. You have to know your road. And there is a saying, if you don't know where are you going, every road will get you there because you don't know. So it's important to know your road in, 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 in your life, taking control over it. And there is always, remember, there is always hope in the most difficult situation. There is always another door, but you have to search for it. And, and I hope that uh, the good people here in the United States will come back to the time when I came to Chicago. When I came in 1994, August 8, 8, 8 94, to Chicago, the United States was different, was better. It was more hopeful. It was uh, more like open. It was re less, definitely less paralyzed. It was a country of the opportunity to each of us. That was the best thing that ever happened to me when I came to U.S. I came, I, there was given chance to me. So my message to American people is we just need a chance. We are good people, all of us in the United States. We are good people. We want to have uh, our children, uh, our life for our children uh, good, for life for us good. We need opportunity and we will put effort. That's the message for leaders who are leading us and to give us opportunity to do what America used to do. So tell me about that journey. So you come to Chicago. Do you have any money at the time? No, no money. No money. No money, no money. I was a, a funny, many funny stories with no money. I, I bought, uh, I'll tell you a story. That, uh, I bought, a, I, I saw a jacket. Uh, I didn't have a jacket. I came in, uh, winter is coming in Chicago in, in September. And I saw the store leather jacket. I like it. I didn't have money. I came to the guy with uh, limited English. I said, I want that jacket. He said, okay, it's $300. I said, okay, no problem. I'll give you 50 and I'll come next month, every month. I got some government money because I was a refugee. 
He said, no. I said, yes, you will. I don't know. Either he trusted me or he was scared of me. He gave me the jacket. <laughs> when I came back later, like a couple months later, with the money, $250. He was running away from me. He forgot about me. There's a guy in Chicago. He has 1,000 customers. He forgot about me. When he remembered, he was so uh, so like happy to see that. And that's how I got my first jacket in Chicago. Okay. Then I started studying hard, hard, passed my exam. Uh, came to Phoenix, did a uh, residency in psychiatry. And from that refugee that almost stole a jacket, but I paid for it later, uh, I became a teacher for students from three major medical schools, like Mayo Medical School, Phoenix uh, University of Arizona Medical School, and Crato Medical School. And I'm associate program director for residency training. Every single day I teach new doctors and new students. I teach them about life. I teach them about psychiatry. I teach them about humanity. And I teach them things they are not going to find in our medical book. I teach them how to be a doctor, how to be a good person. And they always uh, thank me about that because uh, and I'm using my own experience and uh, giving them uh, some lesson how to be good. So you come here with no money. You have a wife and two children. Yes. Uh, and you're trying to ink out a living, uh, trying to be able to make things work, feed your kids, do all those types of things. And your first job was being a teacher? Uh, my my first uh, job in Chicago was I was uh, believe it or not uh, six months after I came uh, to U.S. My first job was interpreter. An interpreter. Yes. Okay. What were you, who were you interpreting for? Psychotherapy. Psychotherapy for Dr. Fabry from Chicago. I interpreted for her, who was uh, um, uh, who was uh, establishing a refugee a mental health program for Boston, Chicago. I was interpreter six months later. Huh. Yeah. And did you enjoy that? Yes, and I learned a lot. What did that you learn? Time, I learned about psychotherapy. I learned about uh, humanity. There are good people everywhere, mm -hmm. and there is always hope. And we can we can go back to help each other. And how we do that? Uh, the question is, how do we help after like we are going back to media and bad news and trauma? First, anything in psychology and psychiatry. First thing is to recognize to recognize that bad news is bad. Without that, we cannot do anything. So recognize that the bad news can cause us to be fearful and anxious and polarized. When we recognize, then we have to organize ourselves. Personally, family, community, uh, state of Arizona, whole country. We have to go back to what the United States is known. It's by uh, freedom, it's by opportunity. And we have to go back, and I know we can do it. Just each of us has to do effort. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a pessimist or optimist on some issues. You tell me which one you think you are. All right. Um, first in life, would you see yourself as a pessimist or an optimist? Optimist. And how can you become an optimist after all the terrible things that you saw in Bosnia? That was just a little piece of my life. I'm not that part. This is just a little part of me. I learned from it, actually. I think I became better, uh, believe it or not, better person because there are many people, it's important to know, uh, after people are traumatized, 20% uh, people develop uh, PTSD. Over 60% of people develop something called post-traumatic growth. People become better. They learn from experience. I use my experience helping others. I don't share my story with patients, but I help them and, and uh, help them to understand trauma and life. And that's how I help them using my own experience. The ability for most people, maybe not all people, but most people uh, to be able to deal with trauma. Would you see yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? Optimist. You think most people can overcome trauma? Most people do without any treatment. That's also interesting. We are resilient people. If you meet, uh, you don't need to uh, see me or therapist to deal with PTSD. You see somebody good, like I, I met Peter Galbraith. That was turning point, uh, like 10 days after my release of concentration, concentration camp. You have to meet somebody good. That's what I met uh, Dr. Febri in Chicago. I met Peter Galbraith. I met people in Phoenix uh, who helped me in, during the residency, my teacher and professor. And, and uh, you need uh, another human being. We cannot live alone. You need another human being to be with you and recognize you need some help, a little push. Okay, so you saw neighbors and friends, some of them do some horrific things to other people. 
Um, on the other hand, you've had people who helped you. Uh, in general, when, you say, uh, when it comes to human nature, would you say that you're an optimist or a pessimist? Optimist. Optimist, why? Because that's, uh, that's who I am. And I'm learning from experience. There is, again, uh, things will happen uh, around us that we cannot control, you or me or anybody else. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we are responsible for things that we can control. And being a good person, uh, being, I mean, being human, being human, it has to give you hope. The future of the United States and the world, are you an optimist or a pessimist, long term? Hopefully, with a good, uh, as much as I understand politics, with good leadership. I believe 100% in good America, mm -hmm. in, in, in life to be, to be back like it used to be when I came in 1994. Do you think we still have an important role to play in the world? I think so, uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed by, uh, I love Ronald Reagan's speech when he spoke about immigrants. Uh, I know that you were a refugee, but you know, he talked about uh, the city on the hill that he always saw, that it had, uh, if it did have walls, it had doors that were open to people to be able to come through if they were willing to buy into the same principles and concepts that we had. Um, I think it is a beacon for the rest of the world. I think that it should be a beacon. We may have some dark days, but uh, um, but I think in the end we do overcome them. All right, pessimist or optimist for uh, your future and your family's future here? Definitely optimistic. Optimistic. Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, and for most people's future here in the United States? I am optimistic, again, because it's uh, we have to take, uh, as a people, we have, to, uh, we have to clarify a few things. We have to uh, readjust. On, on some, again, uh, when I talk about news, try to read uh, uh, news with limited time, try to reestablish communities, very important. Go back to art, good news, uh, sp sport, uh, uh, exhibition, uh, traveling. Go back, enjoy life, life after this, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, pandemia will go away. How old are your children now? 32 and 30. All right, so if you had a... Uh a grandchild, or if you if you were giving advice to younger children, would you give them advice that being a psychiatrist is a good job? Uh, I, I think it's the best job that that I ever had. <laughs> uh -huh. Best job that you ever had. Would yeah. you advise them to do it? Uh, I would. I I I really in my personal life, I stay away for, from advices. Okay. I I talk about that. Uh -huh. I talk about it. And if someone wanted. Uh, to follow your footsteps in terms of being a psychiatrist without having to go through the concentration camp to get there. Uh, how do they do it? How does someone become a psychiatrist? I, I, honestly, like, I think this is the, the, best, the best that can happen to, to, to person, to be able to go into deep into somebody's emotion, even painful experiences and images they have and uh, some other bad experiences, to be able to understand them and be with them and help them. I think there is nothing more rewarding that person can have than this. Is it hard to get accepted into the schools to become a psychiatrist? It's difficult to get to medical school, mm -hmm. and then to get psychiatrists these days, very difficult. In my hospital, we have over 2,000 applications for six positions, and I'm going to teach them. They are coming in June mm -hmm. of this year, and I teach them every year. 2,000 for six positions? Yes. All right. So. Uh, what are the things that you do if that's what you want to become? Do you study harder or do you have to have extracurricular activities? What are the things that that would help those people become one of those six? Uh, study hard, uh, having mentor, extremely important. And it can be from family or outside of family. Somebody, again, who will tell you a few things from a few experiences, expose them to things that we do. Mm -hmm. I'm, by the way, I'm working as a doctor for more than 35 years. I, I cannot count oh, wow. right now. Yeah. I started in 1985. Now, so. are, are you and your wife now American citizens? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you recall the day when you uh, went through the naturalization process? Yes. Was it a good day when you... It, it is definitely a good day. I'm a Bastian American. I think I'm better American uh, being Bastian, and I'm be better Bastian being American. Okay. So I saw... Um, the letter that you wrote, I thought that you did a great job of trying to articulate the problem that exists today uh, in Bosnia. Just kind of as a recap, uh, maybe for the end of the show, 
Can you tell me where Bosnia is today, what challenges they're facing, and, uh, and what maybe needs to happen to be able to try to fix some of the problems that are there today? After, after the war in Bosnia was ended in 1995, Dayton Peace Agreement, Dayton, Ohio, and that uh, peace agreement was good, uh, ended the war, and that's it, and nothing else is good, and uh, left the country divided. We have too many governments, and then Serbian nationalists and Croatian nationalists right now, they want to divide it again, and uh, we just need, and then United States uh, basically signed that agreement, and I need, we need uh, better help with the United States and the European uh, Union because they signed that agreement, they're going to get Bosnia to right way. We are a rich country, uh, we are rich culturally, we are rich in, in many, uh, many other ways, and we can have, we, we deserve better life. And I think the national community left us a little bit behind because other things happen in the world. And I think they have to go to, to help Bosnia again. It seems like Bosnia was kind of an afterthought of the Dayton uh, Accord, that, the, that they were trying to get to peace first. They took care of the other regions second, and Bosnia was kind of an afterthought. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes. And that we should, we should uh, more in international uh, power to get rid of uh, fascists that we have right now in the power. Oh, they're still fascists. Sir. Oh, man, they are really, really bad. I mean, the language they use, if I, I cannot even talk about it. The language they use to even own people, it's beyond any morality, any, 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 even politics that you probably never heard the, the language they use. Do you have and family there now? Yes. And yes. what's their view of what's taking place? They are a little scared. Do they see kind of the uh, ugly head of nationalism coming back? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, uh, again, Dr. Bashkala, we appreciate you being here. Uh, we appreciate you taking time. And uh, besides this overtime, I'm probably going to have you back again anyway. Okay. This is Paul Johnson. I'm with The Optimistic American. I was very pleased to be here with you today to talk about hope. Thank you. Thank you.